It is so good to be here, and I've looked forward to this day for a long time. I was explaining to my senior team a couple of weeks ago why I wouldn't be here on Palm Sunday at, at New Spring, and I just said, guys, I'll tell you, if I wasn't a member of our church, I'd be a member of this church, and I mean that. It is just a great church. And your pastor and his wife are two of the dearest friends my wife and I have in the world. And it is a joy to be here. I, I'll be honest, after hearing these marvelous and, and so appropriate tributes and, and the worship here at, at First Indian Trail, I feel like the most unnecessary person that could possibly be here. Like someone said, I feel like a mule at the Kentucky Derby. But uh, <laughs> we will do our best to bring a talk today that I think God has for me to bring. You know, I was thinking a couple of weeks ago, what should I say about Pastor Mike? And I didn't want to say something tried or banal. I wanted to, I wanted it to be from God. And I was actually I was on our way, on my way to our four o'clock service on Saturday, and, and is driving to the campus. And I just said, God, what, what, what would be the word that you would want said for Mike? And it was just that fast that the Holy Spirit said, it's the difference between a fireworks show and a lighthouse. Now, we all like fireworks shows. They have their places, and we look forward to them, and we pay to go see them. And you go out there, and it starts off with fireworks cascading against the sky, and there's the grand finale, and then all the fireworks just disappear into the night. But then there's a lighthouse a lighthouse that stays there day in and day out through all kinds of weather, political, spiritual, economic, and otherwise. There's that lighthouse that stands there and, and shines out a light in the ocean. And you guys know about that here in North Carolina because some of the most dangerous waters in the world are in your state, right off the coastline. It's called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. And there are so many ships that lie there under the seas, storms, rough seas, numerous shoals, fog, all that conspires to make the water off Cape Hatteras, some of the most dangerous water in the world. But there, standing above the harbor, is one of the most well-known landmarks in the world, and that is the lighthouse at Cape Hatteras. It sends a light out into the ocean, 20 miles long. And I thought, as the Holy Spirit kind of spoke to my heart, that is what you have in Pastor Mike. Because some of you sailed in a long time ago, and you've been sailing under the preaching, the light of his preaching all these years. Some of us, you know how it is when we walk with God, our walk gets cool after a while and we can slip out of harbor. But wasn't it great that when you sail back in, there was that lighthouse shining right here, standing, preaching God's word, bringing you back to Christ. That lighthouse was there for some of your parents, and now it's there for some of your kids, and it's there for your grandkids. There is something about longevity in a man who stands to preach for God in a church that just can't be duplicated or can't be copied anywhere else. Nothing can take the place of longevity. So when I think about the place of Mike here in Charlotte, I see him as a lighthouse. And Lord knows, you guys here in Charlotte have seen just about every kind of religious dog and pony show come to town over the years. And they've come and they've had their flash in the pan and their day in the sun. But Mike stands here as a lighthouse. And I cannot tell you how humbled I am and honored just to be able to be in your presence on this day to honor Mike and Kathy. It's also a joy to have my wife, Mary Alice. We met in high school in Texas, in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I was 16, she was 14, so we've been walking around together for a long time. We went to college together. In fact, we were on our way to chapel one day, and I told Mary Alice, I'll go anywhere God sends me except to Kansas. And that's... Uh, <laughs> Today, when I speak in seminaries, you know, some young third-year theologue will come up to me and say, I'll go anywhere God sends me except to Maui. And I said, no, you got to mean it. It doesn't work that way. But uh, I do know this. I've been so blessed to have the greatest wife in the world, and, and I could not have been what God has allowed me to be without Mary Alice. And I will just tell you this. Your pastor, as wonderful he is, as he is, he's like me. He married over his head. Would you agree with me that Kathy is a first-round draft choice? But not only do I want to just be here to honor my friend, I believe this is a teaching moment for us today. Because you and I have to ask ourselves about this thing of staying. And that is to find out if we have it. 
One of, I didn't even think about this poem until I came into your campus. I was sitting out in your lobby and I just happened to remember a stanza from the poet Longfellow that impacted me when I was a kid. The stanza said, Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. I'm asking today, do you have that in you, that staying power? Do you have that ability to stay when things get tough? That craving in your heart, not just for success, but for legacy. You know, when you start out in life, it isn't long before you realize if you're going to get things done, you're going to have to have juice. You're going to have to have power. And there are all kinds of power. There's the power of appearance, personal appearance. Statistics and studies have been garnered to indicate that the taller a man is, the more successful he is. The more attractive a woman is, the more successful that she is. And yeah, there is the power of appearance. And there's the power of money. We all know about that. And there's the power of connections and the power of personal giftedness and charisma and the power of education. And all those have their places. But you know, I've learned I'm not going to have any of those in life. (laughs) I'm not going to have appearance or money or connections or extreme giftedness or charisma, and my education is not all that great. But I took some time off. You know, Mary Alice and I live in a very cold place, which I've been in Kansas 33 years, and I still can't get used to winters. They're just cold. So I'm always looking for some place to go in January. So we took a week off and went to Palm Springs, and I sat out there in the desert, and I had an opportunity to read some, and I just reading, was just reading history, and I was amazed as I read about great American men and women who have led us to great heights I was amazed to find out how many of them did not achieve greatness because of any of the powers I just mentioned. But they all got there because of staying power. You know, we believe in our our culture today, it's almost pandemic in our culture to believe that people stay because they are successful. I don't believe the order works that way. I believe people are successful because they stay. Before there was Zig Ziglar, there was Charles Tremendous Jones. He was a great motivational speaker. And I heard him speak when he was late in life. And he said this, he'd been married six, over 60 years at that time. And he said that people would come after, up after he spoke and say, you must, you must, you and your wife must really love each other to stay together 60 years. And he said something that caught my attention. He said, we didn't stay together because we loved each other. He said, we love each other because we stayed together. And so today I want to talk about staying power. But before we get into the meat of the message today, I just want to make the point that all of us, whenever we go into any kind of endeavor that's important, there are going to be phases of that endeavor. I mean, whether you're talking about dating, you're talking about marriage or child rearing or serving out a ministry for God or career, whatever you're talking about, there are stages to that. The first stage is romance. Romance is when everything is wonderful. It's just great. I mean, wow, I can't believe I got this job. Wow, I can't believe that she's going to marry me. Wow, isn't it great to hold this newborn? There's the romantic romantic stage. But then it goes into ordinariness. After a while, it just becomes, you know, the house that you were so excited about is just the house. And the job that you were euphoric that you got hired for, it's just the job. It's just the rat race now. And that woman that you were so excited that would even date you, it's like, she's just my wife. That's the ordinariness phase. And then it goes from romance to ordinariness to difficult. And a lot of people will check out here. You know, I especially think about child rearing. You know, our our church, (laughs) we're opening a new nursery today, a new nursery complex. It's a $3 million nursery. Last year we had 500 babies for Easter. And so today we're opening the new complex. Our median age at New Spring is 29. So I'm always talking to new parents. And they'll, they'll, they're so excited. Oh, Mark, we're pregnant. We're going to have a baby. You know, we were so great. We always wanted a baby. And I'm like, well, I hope you wanted a teenager. Because that's what they grow up to be. You know, Mark Twain said, when a boy turns 13, put him in a box with a hole big enough to breathe. He said, when he turns 17, plug up the hole. Now, what, what's he saying? He's just saying that it gets difficult. And by the way, all the teens listening to this would say it's not easy to be the teen of a parent with a teen. But there's ordinariness and then difficulty and then seeming impossibility. You know what? Those faces that I just described will claim most people. But here is the deal. And if there's one thing that we learn from the Scripture in the lives of great Christian leaders, we learn this, that 
when you stay around for the harvest, the harvest makes all of those difficult stages make sense. And that's why today, on this day that we honor Mike and Kathy, I want to talk to you about staying power. Over the years, God has taught me seven facts about staying power. And this, this is not something I read in a book somewhere. These are just truths that God taught me staying through the difficult seasons of life. And today I want to share them with you. Now, I would get nervous if it's 13 minutes before noon and the pastor just had, he said he had seven points. But we'll, I'm going to get on my horse and ride. So here we go. Here's number one. The essence of staying power is integrity. Listen, guys, when I think about Mike Whitson, I'll tell you what I think about instantly. I think about the word real. Listen, there are a lot of preachers, there are a lot of pastors, and I, I appreciate those who are serving God, but I'll just tell you this. There are a handful of men of God, and Mike is real. He's real whether, you know, we, we've been together in suits and we've been together in flip-flops, you know, and cutoffs, but he's the same person all the time. And guys, if you want to have staying power in your life, you have to be real. I was thinking about in the old days, especially in rural America, there were the carnivals that would come to town and the hawkers that would be selling magic elixir. And there were the magic shows with the magicians doing their tricks. Let me ask you a question. What did the carnivals and the magic shows always do? They always left. They left. Why? Because if they stayed around, people would know that the elixir is not magic. And if they stayed around, it wouldn't be long before they would see through the tricks and nobody would want to see the show anymore. And that's just how it is in life. There was a statement that I wrote for today's message, and I want to just read it to you word for word because I felt like God really gave it to me to give to you. Integrity stands the test of time and the rigors of examination. One more time. Integrity stands the test of time and the rigors of examination or scrutiny. We know just a week or so ago there was a tragic collapse of a bridge in Florida, a pedestrian bridge. It's supposed to be the latest in technology. They hadn't even opened it yet. They were testing it out. And one of the engineers testing it discovered cracks on one end of the bridge. But here was his tragic word to his supervisors. He said, there are cracks, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Listen, guys, in 2018, postmodern America, that is almost uh, the mantra of our culture today. There are cracks, but it's not going to be a problem. Listen, guys, I will tell you, if there are cracks in our integrity, there is going to be a problem. We know by statistics that pastors tend to move. In fact, this is the national average, I guess, somewhere between three and four years into their tenure. And I'm sure there are legitimate reasons for moving from place to place. But at the end of the day, and guys, I'll just tell you, if there's one thing I know in life, I know pastors. I'm at my church 33 years. My dad was at the same church for 50 years. I'm 61 years old. I don't know how I got here. I must not have been looking. But I will tell you this, every day of my life has been in a pastor's home. Started pastoring when I was 20. If there's one thing I know, I know pastors. And I talk to pastors all over the country, and here's what I discover. A lot of guys move because they've preached all their sermons. They've told all their stories. They move because they've done what they do, and they need to go someplace else to start all over again. Your pastor, on the other hand, has walked with God. He has gotten words from God. I mean, listen, guys, he was... <laughs> oh, this is inside the cup stuff. You know, uh, I, I was talking to Mike. First question preachers always ask each other, what are you preaching right now? And Mike was sharing with me what he's preaching through in 1 Timothy and how that the word of God, you know, here's the deal. A guy like that doesn't just whip up a sermon. He gets before God and God gets in his ear and in his heart and then the word comes out to you. That's what it takes to stay. And that's what you and I need because we need integrity if we're going to be able to stay by the way, wearing a mask is hard work. I don't think you'll ever carry anything heavier in your life than carrying a mask. You know, if you wear a mask, and, and, and you know, we were pressured to do that. It's not that you and, you and I are bad people if we wear a mask. It's just that everybody wants to cram us into their mold. And some of us have tried to be so many people to so many people, we don't even know who we are anymore. You know, there, is, there are a couple of dangers in wearing a mask. The first one is, you can be found out. You guys are all too young to remember a show called Andy Griffith. But there was a deputy on Andy Griffith named Barney Fife. And you know what I'm going to say already. You know, Barney was always trying to pretend he was something he wasn't. He was always stepping in it. And we laugh at him. Why? Because he got found out. But I'll tell you something worse. There's something worse than wearing a mask and being found out. And that's wearing a mask and being successful. 
Because if you wear a mask and you pull off the charade, you've got to wear it the rest of your life. Here's the thing I know about you today. If you're wearing a mask and you're pretending to be something that you're not, I know you're exhausted. You're tired because you're just one step ahead of the hounds. Oh, today, let's embrace the reality that if we're going to stay, if we're going to be lasting in our marriages, if we're going to be parents who stay when it gets tough, if we're going to stay in our career until we're successful, then it's important for us to be who we are, really who we are, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, cut in anywhere, and we'll still be who we are. Integrity is the essence of staying power. Here's number two. Any truly worthwhile quest will present you with a quit now moment. You know, that's true. If you're doing anything important, you're going to feel like quitting. Someone will treat you badly. There'll be injustice. You'll run out of means. I mean, you just go up and down the list. There'll be some reason that you'll feel like quitting. And a lot of people quit when those quit now moments come. But you know, when we we think about people who have become famous, often it's because they've gone past these quit now moments. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. Thomas Edison was considered too stupid by his teacher to learn anything. He failed a thousand times trying to invent the light bulb before he got it right. Einstein, I still don't even know what M equals MC square is. But Einstein, the genius, he, he didn't talk till he was four, couldn't read till he was seven, and his teacher said he was mentally slow. Henry Ford went broke five times before he made money. Walt Disney got fired from the newspaper, and his editor fired him saying, you don't have any imagination. <laughs> the Beatles were told by, by, by Decca Records they didn't like their sound, and bands with guitars are going out anyway. I mean, you just, just look up and down the history of our world, and you'll discover that some of the most successful people are people who had quit now moments, but they kept going. How much more important is it for us who are followers of Jesus Christ? The Bible has said that God is with us no matter what. Any truly worthwhile quest will present you with a quit now moment. But number three, a life of quitting early will leave you with an inventory of unfinished business. You ever see somebody just hop from marriage to marriage, hop from relationship to relationship, hop from job to job, hop from friendship to friendship to friendship, hop from ministry to ministry? You know the sad thing that I think about when I think about those people? All they ever have is the beginning. They never stay around to see the completion. Again, you guys are too young to remember this, but when I was growing up in Texas, um, I used to want a set of encyclopedias. For all of you under 40, we used to read something called books, actual books. They had like (laughs) covers and spines and paper pages. But what I really wanted was a set of encyclopedias. But we didn't have the money. So in those days, grocery stores would sell sets of encyclopedias one volume at a time. They wanted to keep coming back every week. So every week they would launch a new volume. And the first volume, they would always sell for 49 cents, but the other volumes were like three, four, five dollars a piece. I never had the money to buy the B volume through the rest of the alphabet. <laughs> but I promise you, if you could have gotten into my bookshelf after the years passed, I had a whole bookshelf of A volumes. <laughs> and man, if the teacher gave an assignment that started with A, I was ready to go. <laughs> now listen, guys, I'll tell you something. In pastoring For 40 years, pastoring my church 33 years, I've seen people that all they have is a shelf of A volumes. They start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. So the thing about quitting early, it will leave you with an inventory of unfinished business. Now let's go to number four. Anytime you try to do something worthwhile, especially if it's for God, you're going to have opposition. Scripture tells us over and over that Satan is the power behind this world system. So the moment you step out to do anything great for God, raise your kids to follow God. The moment you set out to have a godly marriage, the moment you decide to volunteer here at First Indian Trail to do a ministry, the moment you join the worship team, the moment you do anything that's good and important and transcendent, you're going to get opposition. And that opposition is going to take the form of people. You're going to have people that are against you. And you know what you want to say? You want to say, isn't this hard enough without having somebody give me trouble? Now, this is really important. When that moment comes, and Pastor Mike has, I'm sure, been there many times because he's led this church through so many seasons of growth and expansion and outreach. I'm sure through the years there have been people who stood up to stand against him, and some probably have broken his heart. And here's the thing. At that moment, if we're not cautious, mission creep can happen. Because what's the mission? The mission is to achieve the objective. 
Hey, you're God's woman in God's time doing good, God's job. You're God's man in God's time doing God's job. What's the objective? Achieve the mission. But all of a sudden, somebody stands up against us, and the mission can change from achieving the objective to beating this person. Hey, guys, here is number four. You don't have to beat your opposition. You just outlast it. Could I say that one more time? You don't have to beat your opponents. Just outlast them. I mean, it's not like you're getting into a fight. You're just saying, I'm standing right here. Listen to the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. The Bible says we're not fighting against human beings, but against wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world. And then in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, the Bible says the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, I want you to think about this as a set of brackets. The front bracket is what we saw first. We don't fight against people. Are you, are, you, are you saved? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ today? Then you don't, have any pe- you don't have any enemies who are people. None of your enemies are people. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you do not have a single person that you're against. Because the Bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We understand that there's bigger, bigger enemies out there. Our enemies are spiritual demons. And and so consequently, we understand that if people begin to stand up against us, I'm not fighting against the people. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I have no enemies who are people. Then the second thing that we learn, the second bracket is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not earthly weapons. See, I'm fighting spiritual enemies in the, in, in, in the heavens that are demonic in nature, and, but, I'm, but I'm not fighting with earthly weapons. I'm not fighting with sarcasm and getting even and, and anger and temper and rage. And I'm not fighting with, you know what, I'm going to do it to you before you do it to me. I'm not fighting that way. Those are the weapons the world fights with. We don't, we're not relegated to those. The Bible tells us we don't fight against people, and our weapons are not human. We got weapons like the Word of God. We have weapons like prayer. We have weapons like love. We have weapons like obeying God when everything else doesn't seem to make any sense. Hey, we don't fight against people, but our weapons are mighty through God. And this is what the Bible says, to the pulling down of strongholds. And this is, let me t- this is, this is why this is so essential in 2018 today. The word stronghold there means a pervasive Universally believed lie that Satan has promulgated. Wow, we need that today, don't we? Let's move right on real quickly. Here's, by the way, uh, let me throw one more verse for you to consider. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible says, Put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. God never told us to hit anybody. He said, just stand. And when the enemy comes, the op- when you have opponents come, you remember my, my enemy's not my mother-in-law, it's not my kids, it's not my next door neighbor, it's not somebody else at church, it's not someone else in, you know, that I'm angry at at work. Our opposition is Satan and the challenge is to stand. I wrote this down because I thought to myself, I've had to remind myself time and time again to say this, I'm not going to hit back, but I'm not going to move. Do what you want to do to me, but by the grace of God, I'm going to stand right here. You come back tomorrow, I'm going to be standing right here. You come back a week from now, I'm going to be standing right here. You come back six months from now, I'm going to be standing right here. Come back a year from now, and I'm going to be standing right here. I'm not going to hit back, but I'm not going to move. And if I go down, I'm going to go down standing right here. Number five. Battles are won at moments that don't feel like victories. Now listen, listen, this is... You talk about people quitting early. This is one of the main reasons people quit early. They don't realize that there's a tipping point, and that tipping point won't usually feel real good. You know, we, we, we tend to think that the victory is going to come. We're going to wake up one morning, we're going to feel really great, and, the, you know, the birds are going to be singing, and the sky is going to look different. I'm just going to wake up and know that I have victory. It doesn't usually happen that way. See, victory is had by holding on when things are tough, and a lot of times the battle is won. And it doesn't feel like a victory. I don't even know how to preach this today. Just maybe God's going to teach someone here today through his Holy Spirit. I'm from Texas. And uh, down there, there's a building everybody wants to see. Right down in the center of San Antonio, Bayer County, there's a little building called the Alamo. And everybody, when they come to Texas, they want to see it. I've been speaking in San Antonio. I've been on the elevator with people from other countries around the world. I didn't understand anything they were saying except I understood Alamo. Everybody wants to see it. Do you realize realize the Alamo was a colossal defeat? 
183 men fought in the Alamo. They all got killed. I mean, why in the world would everybody want to go to the Alamo? The truth of the matter is, there is a place where the Texas Army won an enormous victory and won independence. This is a little marsh out on the east side of Houston called San Jacinto. There's a monument there. But you know, I lived in Houston. My first church after I graduated from college was in Houston. We had a lot of people come see us. Nobody ever asked us to take them to San Jacinto. But everybody wants to see the Alamo. Why? Because battles are won at moments that don't feel like victory. At the Alamo, they bought time. They bought time for the army in San Jacinto to coalesce, and they were willing to stand there and give their lives in order to pay the price for victory. And that's what happens in your life and my life. A lot of times we'll look back in retrospect and say, wow, God was all over. What is it we say? It was a God thing. We didn't feel it at the moment, did we? Number five, battles are won at moments that don't feel like victory. Number six, quickly, in the endurance versus escape struggle, it's the vision of the payoff that tips the scales. In Galatians 6, verse 9, the Bible says, Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't quit. This and I'm finished, number seven. Wow, if I've learned anything, I've learned this. We tend to overestimate our own strength and underestimate God's. You know why we have the quit now moments? At least this is how I have, why I have them. I look at the objective. I look at the mountain, and I turn around and I look at my resources, and I say to myself, I don't think I have it in me. I don't think I can stay another day. I don't think I can go another mile. I don't think I can take this abuse one more time. I don't think I I I have it in me. I don't have it in me. But therein lies the problem, because at that very moment, I am overestimating Mark's strength, and I'm underestimating God's. I grew up with a wonderful hymn, and probably a week doesn't go by that I don't think about one particular lyric from the hymn. It's the song, He Giveth More Grace by Annie Johnson Flint. And I love this particular line, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done. And this is my lyric. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. See what I'm saying? We tend to overestimate our own strength and underestimate God's. If I'm talking to somebody today and you just even in the service today, I've had people come tell me the sermon is for me. And I may be talking to someone, you're hearing this and you say, Mark, I'm just, I'm out, I'm out of strength. I've just gone as far as I can go. Well, you know, you never were meant to live life by yourself. He was 33 years old. He was a millionaire. He was an insurance executive. He only worked six months out of the year. He was a good-looking guy. He had women. He had cars. He had boats. He had all, he had all the toys. He also had something else. He had a 357 Magnum in his car. It was loaded. He was only about a mile from our church campus, and he was looking for a spot, a secluded spot to pull his car over, put the gun in his mouth, and take his life. It's been about 15 years ago. We were on the radio then, on every day, and they archived all my messages through the years. I have no idea most of the time what was playing. But on this particular day, they were playing through an old series I'd preached on the Holy Spirit. It was kind of a throwaway line, really. I I just was wanting to preach to everybody, God never intended us to live life by ourselves. And I said, that's the reason he gave us the Holy Spirit. We were never meant to live by ourselves. All this guy, I don't know why this guy turned his radio on. While he was looking for a place to commit suicide. And he happened, of all things, to turn on our broadcast. And all he heard was, you can't live life by yourself. And he pulled his car over and he decided to listen to the rest of the broadcast. And he made up his mind that wherever our church was, he was going to contact us and reach out. Can you imagine his amazement when he discovered we were only a mile away? And he called the office, got a hold of one of our receptionists. (laughs) And here was his question. He said, "Uh, is this a church with a pastor who says you can't live life by yourself? receptionist said, well, sounds like my pastor. He said, is there any way I can see him? She said, I don't know. He's kind of hard to see and there's no appointment. But she said, I'll tell you what. She could tell he was distraught. She said, I'll, I'll, I'll call him. Stay on the line here and I'll call him. And she called me on my cell phone and by the grace of God, I was like a mile away. And I came up to the church and we sat in my office and he told the stories. I've kind of shared it with you. And I said to him, hey, listen, there's wonderful news. 
There is something that your money can't buy. God loves you with all his love. And he sent his son into the world to live the life that you can't live. He pinch hit for you, pinch ran. And then he turned around and laid his life down on a cross and the blood that came out of his body the way God saw it. It was currency that paid for everything you've ever done wrong. And if you'd be willing to invite Jesus Christ into your life, God would forgive you of all your sins and he'd give you a reason to live. And he knelt down by my coffee table. I still remember that day. He knelt down by my coffee table and he prayed and he gave his life to Christ. I baptized him a week later. A couple years later, he had to move back to Chicago for his business. In those days, I always was quoting Lincoln. And so he came into my office the day before he left and he said, Pastor, I want to leave you something. He said, I was at an auction. He, I, it's the most expensive antique I have. It's, anyway, it's beautiful. He came into my office and he said, I was at an auction and I thought about you and I couldn't pass this up. He said, I want you to have this in your office. So every day when you look at it, you won't forget the guy who was going to take his life. But he stopped because he found out you can't live life by yourself. Some of you are about to quit because you're trying to do it by yourself. You say, well, Mark, you don't understand. I, I'm, I'm not like Pastor Mike. I, I, I've, I've got the hiccups and the starts and the stops, and I've made such a mess of things. Oh, I think that's one of Satan's biggest tricks to get you to quit. I made such a mess of things. <laughs> I grew up a pastor's kid. And so that means I, you know, was always going to church. And back in the day, you always wore suits to church when you were a kid. And my parents, when I was about 10 or 11, they bought me this suit. And they fell in love with it. It was bright copper. <laughs> I mean, you just had to be there in the late 60s. I'm just telling you. It was bright copper. When the sun shone down, it just light up the west side of Fort Worth. <laughs> and every time I wore that suit, my dad was just crazy about that suit. But we had dinner on the ground after church one day, and I spilled apple pie all over the front of it. I mean, just caked it up with apple pie. And I knew how much my dad loved the suit, so I, I was too ashamed to tell him. So I hung it in the back of the closet. And dad would say, where's the suit? And I'd say, well, I don't know. I just felt like wearing green today. And after a while, he kept asking. I thought, he's going to go in there and look. So I took the suit, and I rumpled it all up, and I crammed it in the back of a dresser drawer. And Dad would say, where's the suit? And I'd say, well, yeah, I'm just going to wear something different today. But after a couple of months, the guilt just got to me, and I took that rumpled, not, not just apple pie cake suit, but now this suit has been crammed into the drawer. And I took it to Dad, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I ruined the suit. Dad looked at it and said, that's no problem. Well, let's take it to the dry cleaners. I didn't even know about dry cleaners. <laughs> Dad said, that's not a problem. We'll take it to the dry cleaners. He did. I mean, a couple days came back, hung up, looked brand new. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us feel like we got to quit because we made such a mess of things. And then we've stuffed our life in the back of the drawer. 